Another glorious morning dawns on planet Earth as the sun rises on a day JD Killzone uploads a new bookbinding creation. Forget your woes of winter and join me today in celebrating footage that was captured when the weather was far more inviting and sublime as I create a client commission with very unique specifications, namely handmade cotton rag paper interspersed with embedded flower sheets, as well as the uniquely requested detail of tea-stained doilies sewn into the mix, snakeskin patterned leather, and a pink crystal to top it all off. The rest was left up to my imaginings. Let's see what I do with it, eh? What's a book without paper? Boom. Bam. Bang. Yep, that's right. Feast your eyes on this recycled paper. To all the naysayers who called me out for using a new package of printer paper the first time, joke's on you, because I didn't have any recycled paper to use that first time since I burned all my homework from high school in a bonfire. And I just needed printer paper anyway, because I'd just moved, and I didn't have any of my own just yet at the time. But now, using the trimmings of paper edges and sketchbooks and other mismatched odds and ends I acquired along my life's progression, I will make true recycled paper. No, you want to make your own? Here's what you gotta do. Tear up old paper into little bite-sized chunks and throw it in a blender. I add that good old single-ply toilet paper in as a good measure for achieving a bit of softness to the pages. I'll let you in on something. I have no idea if this does a thing. I just saw it once and thought it was funny that I used toilet paper in my lavish professional papermaking process. From there, fill your blender so the waterline covers all pages, and then a little more on top of that. Then, do what blenders do best. Blend, baby. You're looking for a creamy texture, almost. You don't want any big chunks. It's called paper pulp, and we're looking for what your brain pictures as pulpy. Now there it is, my paper making setup. Generously fill a bucket or tub with water. I've got a storage container that was emptied during the moving process, and, uh... And add your pulp. I also add a bit of water-soluble PVA glue to the mix, with strength and adhesion in mind. Stir with a mixing implement or your arm. Then, take your mold and deckle, in my case, two wood canvas frames and some chicken wire and staples, and dip them gently into the depths of your pulp bath. Your aim is to surface again with enough pulp in the frame that there are no holes or thin areas. Water will drain through the mesh below, though, in my observance, it sometimes needs assistance with its drip dry, of which I am happy to oblige. I then allow it even more attention by sopping any remaining water with the trusty blue shop towels. And now, you just cross your fingers and pray to whatever deity, deities, or empty void you pray to because we need the strength of even antimatter if that's what it takes to separate a page seamlessly without hiccups or tantrums. Initiating montage protocol, namely paper making and lawn mowing. Marvel at the professionalism and mastery of my craft. As you'll come to understand if you're new, my ideal brand is cheapskate setups with surprisingly professional results. Who cares if my blender was $3 from Goodwill? Who cares if my book press is two little woods held together with screws and washers? We make it work in this house! But I digress. When creating the botanical sheets, there's one extra step. As soon as the pulp is pulled from the bath, as the water drains, I sprinkle and arrange the blooms to my liking, pressing the more loose floral sprouts down into the sheet's pulp. From there, the process is the same. I typically have two areas for completed sheets. As I work on one, the previous one dries for a few minutes, and after I need the space freed up for the next timber-esque tenant, then I move the sheets onto parchment paper basking in the sun. And yes, for those of you wondering, these are the same shop towels from my first bookbinding video, still going strong, yet my plans to make a recycled shop towel book are becoming more and more concrete. Now for our doilies. I loved this idea from the client. I hadn't seen it done previously, but I bought a package of doilies big enough that I could continue doing it for other books in the future. They are delicate, as one would imagine a paper doily to be, but this will not stop their necessity of being tea-stained. 
Very intelligently foreseeing this occurrence, I prepared myself to lose fallen doilies along the way, and also made extras to have plenty to choose from in my eventual bind. And what better location than the wooded mountains? I thought it prudent to bring my bookbinding materials for sewing to capture some uwa aesthetic footage, and neglected to remember this would also mean that I needed to wear my designated client binding dress, which dampened the majesty of the experience, but not the footage. First, I fold all agents of the book, homemade paper and doilies, in half with the apparatuses of the trade, a bone folder and a cute polished stump. Second, I arrange all sheets and doilies into their respective signatures. I settled on a three-sheet signature grouping, with the flower sheet being the middle of the two plain white. Doilies are tastefully added and exhibited in a manner that is random and, uh, tasteful. I mark the signatures by hand. I recommend using a straight edge of some sort if you want to be extra precise. With twill tapes in hand, I snip. Cut a generous amount, twice the width of the spine at least, and for thread, I count out and unravel lengths equivalent to the number of signatures, plus at least three more. Behold, feast your eyes upon the magnificence of nature and the beauty of bookbinding with the twill tape case method. If you've stumbled upon this video by happenstance and are interested not in the craft of bookbinding, but maybe your autoplay simply fed me to you and you can't reach the remote while you're busy cooking, what I mean by case binding is a method in which the spine is hollow, and in my case, even curved on the exterior. This book is not bound with cords, such as in medieval binding, but instead around small fabric strips that will eventually be attached to a cover that is created externally. When all signatures are properly sewn and assembled to my liking and command, I pack up my things and close the woodland sector of this adventure. This book is now off to be glued. So, glued it shall be. And I do declare, glued quite a lot, as most books are. I myself was surprised upon first learning the craft at truly how much glue makes up the percentage of a final book. Fine linen is used as an anchor to the signatures for when they are dry, something to fill the gaps between and keep the spine tight and in a rounded formation. For the spine, I measure lengthwise and widthwise with a soft tape measure to account for the horizontal curvature. I add two ribbon bookmarks, both in tasteful white, to complement the eventual colors of the cover, leaving a large excess on the end for later trimming. They are fastened prior to the headband process, as headbands are sewn over top of them. The spinal measurements collected earlier are then translated onto flat board that will be cut and shaped into the rounded spine. I always say to cut the grain in the direction of the board that is bendable so it will be easier to round your cardboard later. So here, as you can see, I'm not doing that. Whoops. It isn't a make or break scenario, luckily. I've found that for books this size, Pringles cans make excellent mediums for rounding spines with equivalent curvature. Off camera, I wet the cardboard with just enough water to make it flexible throughout its length. I then coated both sides and edges with PVA glue, wrapped it across the surface of the can, and tied around the spine from the bottom to top until it was tightly flush to its surface. I always allow two days or more of rest for complete bone brittle dryness. And as you can see, my personal method for adding spine ridges is polymer clay, so I do the only thing I truly know how to do with polymer clay, and that is roll out snakes and then cut them to size. As the spine commences in drying, I proceed to work with the text block on its next edition of headbands. I use diamant metallic thread, 
thinner and somewhat stringier than typical embroidery floss. But I love the subtle thin shimmer for books in particular. That's not a brand deal or anything. I doubt anyone who supplies any products to Joanne's craft and fabric store knows how to even open a browser and log onto YouTube to begin that process. The last accoutrement of the text block are its cover sheets, and this client requested the same thick gold washable paper exhibited in my previous crystal book binding video. To match the energy of the handmade paper, I manually deckle the edges of these cover pages only on the side that meets the text block. A thin line of glue is added to adhere to the text block itself, and then even more sweet, sweet drying time for this little guy. Before beginning with embossing and leatherworking, this is what my covers look like once bonded to the finished spine. I use canvas as a malleable yet sturdy material to bridge the gap between the separate pieces, attaching on the interior of the cover where any bumps it creates will not be seen. Separately, I've begun with design and measurements of cover embossing on another piece of bookboard. This will be a two-tiered design, and I opted for a polygon I've not yet implemented in a client crystal book, a diamond resting in a rectangle. Some folks are lucky enough to use laser cutters. In this house, we use our wrists and box cutters. Who do you think I am? What tax bracket do you really think I'm in? Uh, don't answer that, actually. You'd be too generous. With both tiers and all geometries cut out, I unite all pieces in their respective places to the cover. I use PVA glue for this step, but wood glue is certainly an acceptable substitute. To create the form-fitting final resting place of the gem, I lay a base of polymer clay and carve out a sufficient mock-up of the shaped surface. This work is done directly on the front cover, and as such, the entire cover will be placed in the oven to complete the hardening process of the clay. I use lower temperatures and longer times than recommended when such an important piece of mostly not clay is baking for related matters. Yes, the snake skin leather. This is not leather from a snake, if you couldn't tell from the sheer width of the cut. My goodness, I'd love to see a snake big enough to fill that cut. No, this is bovine leather with snake embossed patterning. Thin, between 0.4 and 1 millimeters. A recommended weight for book binding. Cut much more than you need, please, for me. As you may be familiar with my leathering process by now, I begin from the center of the spine and work my way out. Using leather glue or leather cement, I prefer to go section by section, embossing delicately and attentively with my fingers and the bone folder. An added but anticipated challenge, just as I feared. This leather is among the more stubborn, the more headstrong, the more rigid due to its design. Thinness was not a factor, no. It's one of the thinnest I've used yet. One of the most obstinate, mullish, however, I rose to the challenge. The embossing appears subtle amongst the natural patterning of the leather, and it is there to stay thanks to my sturdy hands and unbending will. With tailored edges and cleaned up creases, this encasing shell is finally ready to become one with the text block. The block has been tethered and the cover pages glued down. Now, all that is left is what ties all aspects of design together into its final form. C client book three, uh, prime. 
When attaching metallic accents, leather glue would hypothetically be enough for permanence, but I am untrusting and impatient with its drying time, and as such, a droplet or two of Loctite is added as a reinforcement. Gold elements are utilized to complement the gold rim around the pink crystal. Their places have been, of course, predetermined by me in the original design layout, and now that the pieces find their permanent residencies that will stretch into oblivion and beyond, I may rest easy knowing harmony was found within my work. As the book's ties are tied, so too are the ties of my weary soul. The very final touch that I place on all of my books at the very end, my signature, in gold leaf this time, to match our front notions. And with that, the completion of my signature indicates only one thing. Time for the final reveal. There it is, in all its glory. The Dome of the Crystal Serpent, or something fake deep like that. You can name it whatever you want. In its completed state, it will be shipped off to its loving new owner and last generations to come, ideally. I guess it's not my business anymore. You and I are here for the journey, but its destination is for it and it alone. Now, I should stop being weird and dial back into planet Earth for the rest of my outro. Thank you very much if you made it this far. Please do let me know what you think. Did I take this idea and do it justice well enough? Please don't be a stranger. There will always be more shenanigans in the future. And as I sit here listening to this Galant Era playlist that makes sure I return to the simple things in life and become one with my microbial ancestors, I wish you only the best. Unless you are a freaking awesome guy who was born in November and is a little bit crazy and has a serious dislike for stupid people, but is a perfect mixture of Prince Charming and a warrior. Then I wish you only the worst. Bye.